good morning uh, and welcome to my lecture 4 for the course partition of India in print media and cinema. So, right now we are discussing about the history of uh, the partition of India. So, without understanding the history we cannot appreciate the artworks right. So, let us glance through the remaining chapters uh, that we are yet to discuss and which actually precipitated and led to the cracking up of the uh, subcontinent, it is dismembering into uh, two different nations and later three nations that we have today India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. So, today we are going to talk about Lahore resolution uh, that uh, actually took place in 1940. The Muslim political leaders uh, apprehended that if the British introduced political changes in India, then they would become a permanent minority in a democratic society and that they would never be able to defend their fundamental rights. So, the question of becoming minority and protecting the rights for the Muslims actually emerged and this once again was not actually coming from the grassroots or from the common masses of Muslims. This was an idea that first arrived at the level of Muslim political caucus. So, Muslims at that time made up only one fourth of the overall population of India and so they were numerically, numerically speaking they were far lesser than the Hindu majority. They originally wanted uh, separate electorates which uh, we saw in the different awards or the different policies uh, like uh, uh, the, the Morley Minto policy and uh, the Montego Schlemsford uh, Act and then we have talked about uh, the Ramsey MacDonald award. Through all these uh, policies, the, the question of separate electorate was coming up in a more prominent way and it began with the Muslim separate electorate and then it went on to become the a, a separate electorate for the Anglo Indians, the Christians, the Sikhs and so forth, uh, the backward classes, the women the, and then with the Pune pact, uh, the Dalits uh, actually um, uh, became a stakeholder in the political arena. So, the Muslims coming back to the Muslims, they originally wanted separate electorates to safeguard their political, social and religious rights. As a result of the country's political events, the Muslim leaders created an impression that even the right to distinct electorates would not protect uh, the, the needs or the demands of the Muslims. They emergently need to find another long term solution, right. So, um, in, in his Allahabad lecture, we see poet philosopher Muhammad Iqbal, uh, the same poet that had composed the famous uh, patriotic song Sare Jaha Se Achha. Uh, so, Iqbal said that uh, Islam has its own social and economical, economic uh, system which must be implemented by a separate governmental body. So, when Jinnah returned to India uh, to restructure the Muslim League uh, and turn it into a political organization for the Muslim masses, he met with Iqbal. Uh, initially, Jinnah was not sure, but Iqbal sought to persuade Jinnah uh, through his writings that the only answer to the protection of the Muslims minority rights was a or the Muslims uh, uh, right to practice and follow their own style of life freely and fearlessly uh, would be possible only through separation, you know having a separate state for the Indian Muslims where they could live according to the teachings of the Holy Quran and uh, Sunnah uh, of the Prophet. Right. So, uh, even though Jinnah was uh, convinced by the late 1930s, he was not ready to disclose what his new plan was until he was satisfied that the majority of Muslims would support him. However, I mean it still remains contested whether uh, Jinnah was supported by a majority of Muslims. The Muslims themselves, uh, the Indian Muslims or the Muslim uh, Muslims from the South Asian uh, region 
cannot be homogenized necessarily. We see different opinions regarding uh, the future of post independent India actually come up from different Muslim sections. The Bengali Muslims for example, uh, want something very different from what uh, Jinnah is proposing and the conflict as a result arises from the 50s in the through the 60s and finally, there is a new nation state called Bangladesh after the uh, liberation war in 1971. So, a major section of the Muslim uh, communities support for M. A. Jinnah's request to commemorate the day of deliverance on uh, December 22, 1939 was a statement of confidence in Jinnah's leadership, right? whom a section of Muslim masses had begun to see him as their qaid e azam their leader. So, the Lahore resolution commonly known as the Pakistan resolution uh, was a formal political statement adopted by the Muslim League uh, at the occasion of its three day general session on uh, or, or between 22nd and 24th of March 1940, which called for greater Muslim autonomy in British India. Uh, this has been largely interpreted as a demand for a separate Muslim state and in fact, we see that Lahore resolution very smoothly transitions to the two nation theory and from there on there is no looking backward, there is a, a no going back to the concept of uh, a unified India. right? So, and this resolution was presented by uh, A.K. Fazlul Haq. A.K. Fazlul Haq. So, uh, Jinnah called for the 27th annual session of the All India Muslim League to be held uh, from March 22nd to March 24th uh, in 1940 at Lahore. So, Sir uh, Shah Nawaz Khan of Mamdut was appointed as the welcome committee's chairman, while Mia Bashir Ahmed was appointed as the session's secretary. The session was attended by prominent leaders which included Chaudhary Khalikuzam, Nawab uh, Muhammad Ismail Khan, Nawab Bahadur Yar uh, Jang, A.K. Fazlul Haq, Sardar Abdul Rab Nishtar, Abdul, Abdullah Haroon, Kazi Muhammad Isa, I.I. Chundrigar, Sardar Aurangzeb Khan, uh, Khwaja Nazimuddin, Abdul Hashim and Malik Barkat Ali. So, in the meantime something had happened, it is uh, another historic event uh, that happens uh, in Lahore. It is a clash between the Khaksars and the uh, British government uh, regarding uh, donning of the military uniform. We know this as the Khaksa tragedy on March 19, 1940. Uh, it was a result of a clash between the Khaksars and the British government in Punjab regarding uh, wearing of the uh, military uniform. And the Khaksas were actually refrained from wearing the uniform by the British government, but they continued to wear it. It resulted in the killing of around 50 Khaksas and injuring of many more. The clash between the British officials and the Khaksas contributed to a tense atmosphere in Lahore. Uh, so, Sir Sikandar Hayat, who was the who was a unionist leader and the then chief minister of Punjab actually tried to pursue uh, Jinnah to postpone the Lahore session uh, of the Muslim League uh, because of Khaksa tragedy. Jinnah insisted that he uh, you know uh, convene the session. So, he arrived, Jinnah arrived in Lahore um, by rail on March 21st. Uh, to take part in the session. He attended the injured Khaksars in Mayo Hospital. So, he was a diplomat, he knew how to actually uh, maintain his public, uh, his public uh, image. He did attend the Khaksars and uh, so he was able to effectively deal with the Khaksar revolt and yet deliver in his Lahore session. So, Jinnah announced to the press that the All India Muslim League will make a very important decision, a momentous decision in this approaching session. So, he really wanted, uh, he put his heart and soul into this session and wanted uh, it to become 
a success he did not want to postpone it as I, I have already uh, explained right. So, the venue of the session was uh, Minto Park uh, near Batshahi Masjid and uh, Lahore Fort. The inaugural session was planned around uh, 3 in the afternoon on March 22nd on March 22nd. Uh, so, history witnesses that around 1 lakh people attended the public meeting according to uh, a ballpark uh, estimate. Uh, the Nawab of Mamdot delivered the welcoming address as at the uh, start of the session and following that M. A. Jinnah actually delivered a speech uh, that riveted the audience. Jinnah um, in this uh, address actually summarized the events. Uh, of the previous several months, what the development in the independence struggle was looking like according to the, uh, the Muslim leader. So, in his two hour presidential speech in English, he uh, was conclu he concluded that the Hindus and the Muslims belong to two separate theological uh, uh, schools or ideologies to different stands. They, they, they actually subscribe to different social practices and they can identify with very different literary works or very different literature. They draw their inspiration and influence from very different, uh, uh, very different sources of history, artworks and uh, you know uh, cultural, socio-cultural practices. So, uh, Jina would uh, emphasize that uh, the Hindus and the Muslims for example, do not marry and eat together and that they are members of two distinct civilizations, they are built mostly on opposing beliefs and notions. So, their perspectives uh, of life are very dissimilar which uh, implied that if they coexisted it would lead to frequent clashes and conflicts right. This was uh, how he was arriving at his two nation theory through the Lahore resolution. So, Jena pointed to the fact that Hindus and Muslims actually draw influence from very distinct historical periods. The hero of uh, one literature or one uh, world view, one uh, philosophy, one way of life uh, is frequently seen as an opponent by the other. They harbor very different value systems and their successes and failures very often do not overlap. So, in such circumstances uh, to yoke together two such uh, nations within the umbrella of one nation, uh, it would be very, very difficult. One. Uh, and then he also pointed out that the Muslims within that uh, single umbrella would become a numerical minority whereas, the Hindus would remain a majority and it could lead to a rising discontent and eventual disintegration of any fabric uh, that may be built up for such a state's administration. Right? This is actually just going back to the uh, theorists I would harken back uh, my introductory lecture where I uh, mentioned a number of theorists that also uh, actually legitimized a partition of uh, every such country if they lived together would actually experience continuous civil wars, uh, ethnic wars right. So, so Jinnah was of the uh, same opinion that rather than have continuous ethnic wars, uh, civil wars, uh, th there, there be two separate nations. And uh, to quote Jinnah, he says that Muslims are uh, a nation according to any definition of nationhood. We want our people to reach their full potential in spiritual, cultural, economic, social and political life in the way we believe is best in accordance with our own principles and in accordance with our people's genius. Right. So, uh, 
During his speech, he is actually making a reference to Lala Lajpat Rai's letter to uh, Chitaranjan Das uh, from 1924, uh, where uh, the former that is Lala Lajpat Rai states that the Hindus and the Muslims are two independent and distinct nations that could never be combined into one. So, he is actually uh, very cleverly corroborating what he wants uh, with, uh, with, with uh, some statements made uh, previously by uh, some of the Hindu leaders. So, he is uh, uh, representing his speech in a way we see in Lahore resolution as though the two nation theory is also supported by some of the Congress, major Congress leaders. So, in his speech, Jinnah recounted the contemporary situation and stressed that the problem of India was no more of an intercommunal nature, but it has manifestly taken on an international, uh, you know, it has become international in dimension. The gravity of the problem is no longer uh, that of a localized South Asian uh, stature, it, it has become more than that. So, he criticized the Congress and the nationalist Muslims and thereby espoused what we know as the two nation theory and the reasons for the demand for separate Muslim homelands. So, Stanley Wolpart uh, would read that uh, this was the moment when Jinnah, uh, formerly uh, well known as uh, the ambassador and formerly appreciated as an ambassador of Hindu Muslim unity, totally transformed himself uh, into Pakistan's great leader. So, uh, when we look at the resolution, we see that Bengal's uh, chief minister A.K. Fazlul Haq had moved this historic uh, Lahore resolution on March 23. The resolution was divided into five uh, different paragraphs and each of them had only one sentence. Despite its clumsy wording, it had sent out a very clear message. While approving the actions taken on uh, taken on the constitutional issue by the All India Muslim Leagues Council and the Working Committee uh, as stated in the resolutions earlier uh, dated 27th of August, 17th and 18th of September and on, on uh, 22nd uh, of October 1939 uh, as well as on the 3rd of February uh, 1940. Uh, this particular session of the All India Muslim League uh, emphasized and reiterated that the scheme of federation proposed and embodied in the Government of India Act 1935 was completely unsuited and unworkable that is for the Muslim section of India for the Indian Muslims. Although the Viceroy's declaration on behalf of His Majesty's Government uh, on the 18th of October 1939 uh, reassured and declared that the policy and plan on which the Government of India Act 1935 is based will be reconsidered in consultation with the various parties, the different interests and the different communities uh, that are uh, that are existent in India. Uh, Muslim India would not be satisfied unless the entire constitutional plan was actually reconsidered de novo and a new constitution drafted. So, this the, uh, the Muslim leaders actually stated that the constitution as such is untenable, it either be redrafted and reconsidered uh, from the scratch or the Muslims would under the auspices of the prominent leaders, they would go for a separate nation state altogether. The Lahore resolution was backed by uh, members such as Chaudhary Khalikuzam of uh, Uttar Pradesh, Maulana Zafar Ali Khan of Punjab, Sardar Aurangzeb of the Northwestern Frontier Provinces, Sir Abdullah Harun of Sindh and Qazi Muhammad Issa of Baluchistan among others, among many others. The resolution was finally passed on March 24th, which was the last day of the meet. Uh, so, the aims to begin with uh, were not 
for a two nation we have to understand that but it paved these aims actually paved the path for a two nation theory they very smoothly transition to a two nation theory um, so the basic aims were at a glance if we look where a the muslim majority areas of india be merged so that the indian muslims may have an area where they can establish their own independent state and b the muslims who are in minority in the independent units and areas should be consulted with and their interests be taken into consideration uh, and and be protected uh, uh, within the frame of the constitution right they should be able to voice their uh, own interests and protect themselves uh, through the uh, constitutional laws right so uh, let us now look at the controversies centering the Lahore resolution the resolutions formal uh, name was Lahore resolution and it did not include the word Pakistan this term uh, Pakistan resolution was coined ironically by the Hindu publications such as Pratap, Bande Mataram, Milap, Tribune among others. The Muslim people however, their reaction was to embrace such a concept and so the resolution went on to be known as the Pakistan resolution. The Pakistan gov Pakistan's government and citizens incorrectly celebrate March 23rd as a national holiday right. It was first uh, the resolution was first shown on March 23rd however the resolution was passed actually on March 24th to be exact right. So when we look at the different controversies uh, around this resolution. Uh, one of the controversies centers the word states. The word states was used instead of state and it suggests that the resolutions writers foresaw two independent states in India's northwestern and eastern regions. However, when one carefully examines the course of events that followed, uh, one understands that the term states was added uh, inadvertently. Uh, and the league leadership must have reconsidered their decision afterwards. So, the resolution passed at the 1941 Madras session of the league uh, actually stated and I quote, everyone should clearly understand that we are striving for one independent and sovereign Muslim state, unquote. Jinnah used the phrases uh, independent homeland and an independent Muslim state in all his uh, speeches that the protection of minority rights, separate electorate, uh, voicing of the minorities demands within the frame of constitution are all actually precipitating to and uh, adding up to a separate homeland, a separate Muslim state. right? Now, we look at the reaction of the other sections uh, towards Lahore resolution. The Hindus outrightly rejected such a resolution and they called it as the vivisection of mother India. It was called as vivisection and as and, and uh, you know full of imperialist ambitions because such a resolution as the Hindus saw it was motivated to block India's march to independence. Now, uh, when we look at the reaction of the Britishers, we see that at least for two reasons the Britishers were also equally averse to the Muslim demand. Now, firstly they had long considered themselves, the colonizers uh, thought that they were and they claimed you know um, accolades for the, for, for the unity of India and for uh, you know giving India the shape of a nation, a modern nation. So, it was to their credit, they were the architects of a unified India and that credit would actually 
go if India is dismembered. So, this is the first reason why British Britishers were not really happy with the partition. Secondly, we see that they that is the Britishers had uh, considered the compelled unity under the Britannica tax as their greatest achievement and as a as an enduring contribution to history such that Pakistan demand would threaten to destroy the Britishers claim to a unique accomplishment. Right? There are condemnations from different quarters in India by the colonizers, by the Hindu sects, but Indian politics was now firmly established on the path towards Pakistan. So, what are the results of Lahore resolution? The All India Muslim League resolution of March 1940 also came to be known as Pakistan resolution becomes a significant turning point, new milestone and a new event in Indian history that has left indelible scars on world history. With the passage of this resolution, the Muslims of the subcontinent changed their demand from separate electorate to a separate state altogether. The construction of an independent Muslim state was seen as the aim of this resolution, which was opposed to the concept of a united India. So, Lahore resolution was the culmination and the logical consequence of the two nation theory. Critics also say that this was initially seen as uh, useful by the British Raj. However, this contradicted later, this conflicted with uh, the British's interests as London's priority became finding successes in India that are capable of defending British strategic and economic interests in the east of Suez. And in order to protect the British interests, so they wanted successes in India and that required that entailed keeping India united with a strong center and an undivided army. So, uh, it was also in the a lot of critics actually point out that it was in the British's interest to not partition India. Now, from Lahore resolution, we are going to move to uh, August offer also happened in 1940. Uh, with the beginning of uh, World War II at Warda in September 1939, the Congress Working Committee passed the CWC resolution. Uh, Indian leaders position was very clear, uh, they denounced both Nazism and fascism. The invasion of Poland by the Nazis was criticized and the Indian leaders proclaimed at that point that India cannot take a side and fight a war for democratic freedom when such a freedom was denied to her in the first place. Congress leaders had reached an agreement on India's stance on World War II and the resignation of Congress provincial ministers. So, disagreements started cropping up. Uh, however, when it came to launching a mass satyagraha, so we see the disagreements actually however crop up when uh, there is the question of launching a mass satyagraha. On the one hand, we have the different left factions comprising Subhash Chandra Bose's uh, forward block then the Congress Socialist Party and added to them the Communist Party. All of these political factions saw the war as an ideal situation that could uh, facilitate the process of India's independence that could um, uh, enable and strengthen their claim for independence through fighting uh, British colonial rulers head on. So, they saw this as an this vulnerable situation as an opportunity that needed to be utilized the left wing, wing the left wing factions that is. Now, Gandhiji and the congress members were opposed to immediately launching a mass satyagraha because they believed that the allies that is the Britain and the France's cause was correct and that Britain should not be 
discouraged or degraded in their war efforts. So, we see that on the one hand we have the left wing factions, on the other hand there we have Gandhiji along with the, his uh, congress following. And in, the, in this given climate of communal hostility, a civil disobedience movement could easily devolve into communal rioting. That is what M. K. Gandhi uh, actually thought at that point. So, he was not in favor of a mass satyagraha. During the years uh, between 1938 and 1939, uh, there was a lack of discipline and unity among the Congress members. They were taking different positions, they were assuming different positions and making it impossible thereby to start an early mass struggle in, an, in, a, in a unified fashion. In the Ramgarh session of the Congress, which was held in March 1940, we see there is Maulana Abul Kalam Azad is uh, actually uh, the president of this session and uh, the Congress working committee declares uh, that nothing short of complete independence can be acceptable by the people. So, uh, for the Ramgar session of the Congress, which was uh, held in March 1940 under the presidentship, uh, presidentship of Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, we see that CWC states that nothing short of complete independence can be acceptable by the people. Uh, and civil disobedience would be launched as soon as the Congress organization is deemed fit for the purpose or if circumstances so shape themselves as to provoke a crisis. And we see that in Ramgar Bihar, Subhash Chandra Bose actually convened an anti-compromise conference in March 1940. The forward block and the Kisan Sabha collaborated to hold the meeting, the meeting for anti-compromise -com uh, conference. Uh, the conference decided that on in April 1940, a worldwide struggle should be launched that push people not to cooperate. And during this war, the British provided money, men and materials to the allies. Uh, in the meantime, we see that uh, the Nazis are taking char charge in Belgium, in Holland and France and they forced Britain on a back foot. By August 8, 1940, the British government had made a declaration that had became known as the August Offer uh, as a way of gaining the support of the Indians during the World War II. In World War II, Brit Britain's position becomes increasingly more uh, precarious and so they seek India's support, India being one of its in fact its largest asset. So, according to the August offer, India could achieve its dominion status. Now, there is a bargain if India supports Britain for World War II, it could achieve its dominion status in exchange. The offer also mentioned expand. So, one is the dominion status that is offered by the August offer. The second is expansion of Viceroy's executive council and now the war advisory council would include Indians which actually proposed a greater uh, further more agency uh, to the Indians in Indian affairs. So, we see that further the August offer uh, says that after World War II, a constituent assembly uh, comprising Indians would be formed uh, to decide their constitution based on their own social, economic and political beliefs. So, it entailed, the August offer entailed compliance with the government's obligations under defense, minority rights agreements with states and in the all India services. Without the consent of minorities, it stated no future constitution could be adopted. However, the response to the August offer by INC was rejection because uh, dominion status was not acceptable by the Congress at that point. Instead, they were looking for Purna Swaraj. Nehru, Jawaharlal Nehru 
would believe that August offer was as dead as a doornail. Similarly, All India Muslim League, uh, however, we see All India Muslim League welcomed the veto assurance given to minorities uh, and to the Muslim League, but they held that partition was the only acceptable solution for the Muslims. Right. So, on the one hand, INC was looking for Purna Swaraj, on the other, AIML was looking for partition and a separate nation. Gandhiji launched limited satyagraha on individual basis by few selected uh, individuals in every locality. So, we have uh, the individual satyagraha being continued for several months between October 1940 and June 1941. Uh, people were marching towards Delhi, there was the uh, prevalent uh, you know cry for struggle, freedom struggle. Uh, this is associated mainly with Subhash Chandra Bose Dilli Chalo movement, the Dilli Chalo movement. June 1941, there was operation Barbarossa after solidifying their power in Western Europe, the Nazis actually launched an, an attack on the Soviet Union. By December 7, 1941, uh, the attack by the Japanese against the US naval base uh, at Pearl Harbor, uh, Hawaii, we see there are all these different uh, uh, larger uh, historical events uh, that uh, actually play uh, an important role in deciding the fate of post independent India. All these resulted uh, in the entrance of the Soviet Union and the United States in this scenario, which tipped the scales in the favor of the Allies. Right. Imperial Japan was rapidly expanding in East and Southeast Asia. So, British, the position of Britain was further vitiated. Meanwhile, in India, the government uh, released Congress leaders who were imprisoned for individual satyagraha. So, uh, uh, the British Raj was willing to concede. The British government desperately wanted to secure Congress cooperation and save the British territories in India in the face of aggression that it faced from imperial Japan. Right. So, the Congress Working Committee now controlled by veteran leaders such as Sardar Vallabhai Patel and C. Raja Gopalachari actually passed a resolution offering to cooperate with the British government provided and they actually kept a few conditions. A. Full independence must be given right after the war and then substance of power was transferred immediately to the Indians. And at this point, Gandhiji actually designated Nehru as his chosen political successor. And so, we see that this also uh, has leaves an impact among the Muslim masses. They see that the leadership of an independent India would go to a Hindu and not to a Muslim, which further hardened their position for a separate nation. Next, we talk about Cripps Mission. Cripps Mission was headed by a senior minister called Sir Stafford Cripps, who was a, a British cabinet minister and belonged to left wing Labour Party. He came with the proposal to seek the help of the Indians in the conflict because of the setbacks that Britain had experienced in Southeast Asia. As a result of the Allies pressure on Britain, Indian nationalists agreed to support the Allies cause. The main proposals of Cripps mission included Indian Union would be set up with a dominion status and then following the war's end, a constituent assembly be convened to frame India's new uh, constitution as a, in a free state and then members would be partly elected through provincial assemblies. Uh, by provincial assemblies through proportional representation and partly dominated by the princes. Further, Cripps mission says that any province that refuses to join the union could have a separate constitution and form its separate union. Uh, defense of India would remain in the hands of the British and the governor general's power would remain intact. So, Cripps mission actually wanted to hold on to some power and agency in India while uh, you know declaring it as independent. 
Indian National Congress leaders objected to the proposal because the dominion status was unacceptable and they were sticking to the Purna Swaraj, demand for Purna Swaraj. States were represented by nominees rather than elected representatives, right. And the provinces had the right to separate, these were not acceptable. There would be no instant transfer of power and the governor general was still deemed supreme. These were all the setbacks that they identified in Cripps mission and so they rejected it, the congressmen rejected it. So, the failure of Cripps mission if we look at uh, that, the Muslim league opposed the idea of Indian Union because they claimed that it denied the Muslim the right to self determination and establishing of Pakistan. Similarly, Congress objected to the dominion status neither for, for different reasons neither All India Muslim League nor uh, India National Congress were actually happy with Cripps mission. Hindu Mahasabha also rejected and uh, uh, they also objected against the proposal. So, Cripps mission as one sees turns out to be a mere propaganda device right and Cripps efforts were continually thwarted by the British Prime Minister uh, Churchill and uh, the Secretary of State Amory as well as the Viceroy Lynn Lithgow and the Commander in Chief Ward. All of them are constantly thwarting Cripps efforts. So, following the Cripps mission's departure, Gandhiji uh, drafted a resolution uh, which advocated for British's disengagement and a non-violent non-cooperation movement against Japanese invasion. The Congress Working Committee conference in Wardha on July 14, 1942 agreed to a mass struggle. So, the failure of the Cripps mission demonstrated Britain's continued uh, reluctance to comply to India's aspirations for a constitution and subsequent freedom. As a result, any further silence would imply acceptance of British rules in choosing India's faith. There was widespread unrest as a result of rising uh, food costs and shortages of essentials such as rice and salt as well as, as well as the seizure of boats in Bengal and Odisha. We will talk more about the great Bengal famine in 1943 in our on swing lecture. So, in our next lecture. There was there were suspicions that the British administration might use a scorched earth policy which they actually did during the 1943 uh, famine. It was considered as a man made famine um, whose architect was uh, Winston Churchill uh, and the scorched earth policy would be used in Assam, Bengal and Odisha in the event of a Japanese invasion. The news of British losses in Southeast Asia sparked fears of impending British collapse among the Indians, the general masses were now enthralled by the idea of overthrowing the British. The public's faith in the British administration's stability had actually dwindled and people had begun to withdraw from government affairs. The way in which the British withdrew from Southeast Asia, leaving their subjects behind uh, were enough to expose their racism and their claim of embodying lofty ideals of uh, liberty and equality were, uh, were hurt, they were actually all these values were uh, you know they faced a setback because of the British's racist uh, uh, attitude at that point. And so, I think I have to stop the lecture today at this point, I will meet you again for with uh, another uh, series of lecture, the lecture 5 on the same topic history of partition. Thank you so much.